Farm Week is a production of the Mississippi State University Extension Service. Today on Farm Week, we have two feature stories for you. Scientists in the United States and Africa are trying to breed a new chicken, which is resistant to Newcastle disease, a deadly poultry illness. In our Southern Gardening segment today, tired of watering your plants? Gary Bachman will show you a way to water your plants better and less often. In our feature story today, the first one, we'll look back at the year in agriculture for 2012. Drought hit much of the United States, setting up our current beef shortage. It also marked major gains for animal rights supporters. Some would argue the drought in the Midwest and the Plains was the biggest story of 2012, but the story with the farthest reaching consequences may have concerned livestock production. 2012 may be looked upon in the future as a major tipping point. Good day everyone, I'm Leighton Spann. And I'm Artis Ford, welcome to Farm Week. Today it's an all feature story edition of our show. Leighton, our first story looks back at the year 2012 in agriculture. It was a year marked by drought, but fortunately not in Mississippi. Farm Week celebrated a special anniversary that year, and it was a year that saw major victories by animal rights supporters regarding hog and egg production. Some would argue the drought in the Midwest and the Plains was the biggest story of 2012, but the story with the farthest reaching consequences may have concerned livestock production. 2012 may be looked upon in the future as a major tipping point. Under pressure from animal rights groups, major pork buyers and major pork suppliers announced various agreements that would end their production of swine housed in gestation crates. Gestation crates are metal enclosures used in intensive hog operations. Each pregnant sow is fed individually and fighting for food between sows is eliminated. The crates, however, do not allow for much movement. Many restaurant chains, including McDonald's, Wendy's, Burger King, Cracker Barrel, Hardee's, Sonic, and Denny's announced they would phase out buying pork from pork producers who use gestation crates. Major pork producers, including Smithfield Foods, the nation's largest, Prestige, Hormel, and Kraft Foods, were among those who announced plans in 2012 to phase out the use of gestation crates. Kroger, the nation's largest grocery chain, and Safeway, the fifth largest, announced their plans to eliminate gestation crates from their supply chain. The way eggs are produced in the United States is also set to change. Major egg producers came to an agreement with the Humane Society of the United States to switch from conventional or so-called battery cages to enriched cages by the year 2029. The two agreed to sponsor the Egg Products Inspection Act of 2012, which is working its way through the Congress. The United Egg Producers, which includes Calmain, said the joint legislative efforts were pursued to avoid disruption to interstate sales and to develop consistent national standards. Enriched cages have about twice the room per hen than battery cages. They also have different areas where the hens can perch, lay their eggs, and scratch. Livestock producers are concerned what else lies ahead in the future when the animal rights movement seeks to extend its gains. The drought was the national story that dominated the Ag News headlines in 2012. Characterized as the worst widespread drought since the 1950s, it hit the West, the Midwest, the Plains, Missouri, Arkansas, and North Central Georgia. The USDA estimates 80% of the nation's agricultural land and 60% of its farms were affected by the drought. 43% of the nation's farms were said to experience severe to extreme drought. Mississippi escaped the drought for the most part, although conditions were generally drier as you move to the northwest. NASA says global temperatures for 2012 were the ninth warmest in 132 years of record keeping. 2012 was the warmest year on record in the lower 48 states of the U.S., smashing the old record set in 1998. The Weather Channel says 34,000 record highs were set compared to 6,700 record lows. Nine of the warmest years recorded have taken place since the year 2000. Mississippi's row crop farmers had the best of both worlds, good yields and high prices due to the drought. 
Mississippi set another record for farm production value in 2012, $7.3 billion. Poultry continued its traditional dominance with $2.5 billion, 34 percent of all Mississippi's farm production value. High prices and high yields helped push Mississippi soybeans past forestry to second place with a record $1.16 billion in farm production value. Forestry posted $1 billion in farm production value, up almost 8 percent from 2011. Mississippi corn came in fourth with a record value of $891 million. Cotton moved down to fifth with $397 million in farm production value. Acres lost to corn production and low prices fueled the downward slide. Cattle and calves saw a 39 percent increase in 2012 to a record $329 million in farm production value. Farm-raised catfish fell to seventh, down 23 percent to $165 million. Competition from imports and high feed prices are still causing farmers to exit the business. Hay came in eighth with a new production value of $145 million. Wheat ninth, $134 million. Rice came in tenth with $130 million in farm production value. In other national news, the U.S. Department of Agriculture announced in January its intentions to close 259 offices and laboratories nationwide. After hearings were held, 11 of that number came from Mississippi. The closings did put a tarnish on the USDA's 150th anniversary, which occurred in 2012. It was also the 150th anniversary of the Morrill Act, which established land-grant universities in the United States. Mississippi State University was one of the universities picked to honor the occasion in June at the Smithsonian Folklife Festival in Washington, D.C. Even though people, less people are working directly in agriculture today, uh, we still serve that mission as well as uh, broaden, broaden the scope of our mission to include benefits to all, all of society as, as far as economic development, health, uh, youth and families, uh, natural resources. Mississippi's peanut industry expanded in the state with the announcement that the Clint Williams Company of Oklahoma would open buying stations in Greenwood and Clarksdale. Birdsong Peanuts of Georgia invested $3 million in its existing buying station in Aberdeen. There are now three companies buying peanuts in Mississippi. The expansion caused Mississippi's peanut acreage to jump 350 percent to 52,000 in 2012. Average yield per acre was a record 4,400 pounds, with an overall state record crop of almost 216 million pounds. Mississippi soybean farmers harvested a record state average yield of 42 bushels per acre. They planted almost 2 million acres with an overall crop of 82.3 million bushels, worth a record value of more than $1 billion. Mississippi corn farmers harvested a record state average yield of 165 bushels per acre. They planted 820,000 acres for grain and harvested almost 132 million bushels. Mississippi growers were worried that their great corn crop might fall victim to Hurricane Isaac in late August. Farmers rushed to harvest as much as they could before it made landfall. Fortunately, the storm did not cause widespread damage. The first clouds from Hurricane Isaac began to move over Webster County, Mississippi, early Tuesday morning. Grower Stan Rogers of Gore Springs, however, began stepping up his corn harvest schedule several days ago because hurricanes mean lost yield. Said it's supposed to be here Wednesday, and we like about 200 acres. So we're, we're working harder trying to get it out. Expected high prices for corn and soybeans caused cotton acreage to go down in Mississippi in 2012. 470,000 acres were planted, down 25 percent from 2011. The state average yield was 970 pounds per acre, with a total crop of 950,000 bales, down 21 percent. Corn and soybeans also stole acres from Mississippi rice in 2012. Farmers harvested a respectable 7,100 pounds per acre in 2012, but they only planted 130,000 acres, the lowest in 35 years. Mississippi cattlemen set a new record for farm production value, $329 million. The drought in other areas and higher prices and a bigger state calf crop helped to set the record. Overall, the number of all cattle and calves declined to 910,000 head at the end of 2012, off 2 percent from a year earlier. High feed prices and imports hurt the Mississippi catfish industry in 2012. Water acres declined to 48,600, off 5 percent from 2011, and their lowest point since the peak in 2001. Mississippi continued to advance its reputation in next-generation biofuels. Keor announced in May that it had essentially completed its Columbus, Mississippi plant and would begin the process of bringing it online. 
Keyor uses wood chips to create what it calls renewable crude oil, a plant three times the size of the Columbus one is planned for Natchez. A big event was celebrated in early October. Farm Week celebrated its 35th anniversary on the air. Farm Week's first broadcast took place October 3rd, 1977. More than 1,776 have followed. And you can watch this story again on the year 2012 at our Farm Week website, Facebook page, or YouTube. Website address is farmweek.msucares.com. You can try out our Facebook page. Give us a like if you'd like. Facebook fans are the first to see our stories on Friday. Well, Leighton, as we look at this, the Egg Products Inspection Act is kind of bogged down in terms of going through the Congress right now. Somebody tried to make it part of the Farm Bill, didn't make it. So right now, that's kind of in no man's land, I guess. I haven't heard much about it lately. Uh, of course, this fall will be our 37th anniversary. That's right. And this July will be your Hardly. how many years on Farm Week? 20. This July will be Layton's 20th year on Farm Week. And uh, hard to believe it's been that long, but it's been a good ride. We have <laughs> it a good is. We have a good time. Sometimes we even do some work. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, as we saw in that story, the drought, that uh, as we were talking off camera, that again is kind of the beginning of where we are today in the cattle market. That's where it set it up in the cattle market. We got a little respite in 2013, but here we are back again. Very dry, California, Colorado, New Mexico, uh, West Texas. So we're still seeing those prices high, and of course when we go to the grocery store, we're seeing the high beef prices. So Certainly are. No word when I guess that will quit, but it just shows how, how quickly things can turn around. Well, we move now to our trivia quiz on Farm Week, and uh, our question now is about lettuce. Lettuce comes in a lot of different varieties. Today you can even buy it, of course, washed and ready to eat. So here's our question. How many pounds of lettuce does the average American eat every year? Is the answer 30 pounds, 45 pounds, 50 pounds, or up to 60 pounds? I'll tell you after today's Southern Gardening segment. Do you want an easy way to garden in the smallest patch of sunshine? Well, in this week's Southern Gardening segment, Extension Horticulturist Dr. Gary Bachman tells us about the ease of gardening in sub-irrigated containers. Today I want to share a newer gardening trend of growing in sub-irrigated containers. These containers are great for those that have small yards or even just a porch or balcony. This is the commercially available model that I use extensively in my garden called an earth box, but there are others available. It features a reservoir where the water is wicked up into the growing mix like a sponge. This keeps the root zone moisture very consistent. Let's put one together. Always use potting mix that is designed for use in containers. Never use garden dirt. This container will hold two cubic feet of mix. The mix is poured in, compacted, and watered in stages. Dolomite is added for the calcium and magnesium. The fertilizer is placed on top of the mix, and in this case I'm using a granular variety. The wicking of the water will slowly dissolve the fertilizer over time to feed the plants. When you're finished, the container should be mounded and resemble a loaf of bread. I'm going to put this plastic cover on the container to control evaporation. This means the only water that the system loses is what the plants transpire, plus there's no weeding. Now simply cut slits to accommodate your transplants. The number of plants will depend on what you decide to grow. Watering is easy, since all you need to do is fill the watering tube until you see the water come out the reservoir overflow. Sub-irrigated containers aren't only for vegetables. Here's one with tomatoes, but as you can see, colorful flowering plants will love them too. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman for Southern Gardening. Gary says you should be able to water less with a sub-irrigated container, and your plants will get the water they need when they need it. Well, it's time to give you the answer to today's trivia quiz here on Farm Week. Again, it's about the amount of lettuce eaten per year by the average American. And the answer is 30 pounds. This according to the Agriculture Council of America. That's about five times the amount eaten 100 years ago. 
Lettuce is the second most popular vegetable, and it is a member of the sunflower family. We're going to pause now for a break on Farm Week. Coming up, we'll have the calendar and one more feature story for you. A better chicken. Scientists from the United States and Africa are working to breed a chicken that is resistant to the respiratory virus known as Newcastle disease. At Mississippi State University, Extension is reaching beyond the college campus and impacting adult education. We're instructing agricultural professionals on the latest trends in research and technology, inspiring communities, empowering small businesses, and promoting the growth of healthy families where youth and adults can reach their fullest potential. The MSU Extension Service, sharing our vision for the future. Before we get back to our last story, let's look at the Farm Week calendar. A short course on managing your family forest in Mississippi will take place on two evenings, Tuesday, July 8th and Thursday, July 10th in Senatobia. The hours are 5 p.m. to 7.45 p.m. It takes place at the Tate County Extension Service Office on French's Alley. The cost is $35 per person or $55 per couple, and that includes both evenings. You'll learn about sustainable pine and hardwood management, Selling your timber and passing on the land to the next generation will also be covered. You need to register as soon as possible. Now this same short course will also take place Tuesday, July 15th. In this case, all the activities will be on one day. The location is the Yalabusha County Extension Service Office on Highway 7 at Coffeyville. The hours will be 8.30 a.m. to 2.15 p.m. Please register by July 8th. Go to our Farm Week website at farmweek.msucares.com for information on these and other events. Now check out this week's Farm Week Snapshot. Our last story today is about a worldwide effort to control a poultry disease. Newcastle disease is a respiratory virus, one found in many areas, including the United States. American poultry companies vaccinate their birds against the milder forms of this disease, but when it does break out, millions of birds have to be destroyed to stop its spread. In the rest of the world, some developing nations routinely battle outbreaks, which have the potential to wipe out 75% of infected flocks. An international team of scientists is working now to breed a variety of chicken that is more resistant to the virus. Market to Market's Paul Yeager explains. Scientists from the United States and Africa are teaming up to combat a disease capable of decimating a region's poultry population. Newcastle disease, the stronger forms of which can kill more than half of unvaccinated birds can be particularly difficult for producers in developing nations. In most cases, the real target for this work is going to be the smallholder farmers and the villagers. And so they're really having quite marginal uh, both economics and nutrition uh, within their family. And so if they lose half of a good protein source that they were going to depend on for that whole year, it's extremely devastating. The U.S. Agency for International Development's Feed the Future program has awarded the scientists a $6 million grant. The team will study the genetic makeup of various chickens to determine what particular genes make some poultry more resistant to Newcastle disease, the number one health issue affecting poultry production in Africa. Newcastle disease is a respiratory illness. Its symptoms include swelling around the eyes and twisting of the head and neck. The virus causes only mild symptoms in humans, namely pink eye. According to the World Animal Health Information Database, nearly 150,000 chickens and other domestic birds died of Newcastle disease over the past two years. Another 1.5 million were destroyed or sent to the slaughterhouse to prevent the spread of the disease, which is highly contagious in birds. Cyprus, Israel, and Libya are among the countries affected recently. The last outbreak in the United States, just over a decade ago, 
affected poultry in Arizona, California, Nevada, and Texas. More than three million U.S. birds had to be destroyed. Live bird markets, such as this one, filmed by the research team in Tanzania in early 2014, bring poultry from various villages into contact, helping spread the disease. The weaker forms can be relatively well controlled with vaccination, uh, and routinely in the U.S. vaccines are used to protect poultry uh, against this disease. But in developing parts of the world, there's not enough infrastructure or there may not even be the pennies needed to buy uh, a vaccine to protect the bird. In addition to Iowa State University, the five-year study includes scientists from the University of California, Davis, the University of Delaware, and in Africa, Soko Ine University of Agriculture in Tanzania and the University of Ghana. The team will first study two lines of chickens. Leghorn, which are commonly used for egg production in the United States and are more susceptible to Newcastle disease, and Fayumi, which have origins in Egypt and are relatively resistant to the virus. Researchers are trying to pinpoint the combination of traits that appear to correspond with greater resistance. They will then analyze the DNA of individual chickens to understand how these seemingly relevant traits are passed on genetically. So once we have uh, information on which, what genetics uh, provides greater resistance to the disease, then we can go out and, and screen chickens and find the ones that have the right genes and then use those to breed the next generation of chickens. The scientists are looking for the same genetic makeup among African flocks in Africa to avoid introducing a breed which may not be as well adapted to the environment or with which African farmers may be unfamiliar. The team plans to also consider the chicken's resistance to heat and drought. They are interested in being sure that agriculture is ready to respond to uh, the climate change which we anticipate is coming. Uh, which will probably have more heat episodes in them. Scientists say this type of genomics work will likely lead to greater precision when breeding all kinds of livestock. It is a new field, but it's very rapidly uh, developing. Um, you know, the human genome was sequenced, uh, the chicken genome was sequenced in 2004. The chicken was the first livestock species that, for which we got the whole genome decoded. Um, so, I mean, it's all within the last decade that things have started, but it's developing very, very quickly. Feed the Future, a U.S. government global hunger and food security initiative, is trying to emphasize genomics research in both crops and livestock. We have had livestock and animal science research in our portfolio for many years. However, recently, we wanted to increase our investment in the animal science area, and so this year we awarded two new Feed the Future Innovation Labs, one focused on poultry and one focused on a livestock vaccine. And it's an area we're considering and thinking about how to strengthen our investments to ensure that, that households across the countries where we work have access to uh, foods that are really, that have that high density of nutrition. In this case, the more resistant chickens will be provided to villagers in Africa, typically in association with a school. The children, as well as local women, will be trained on proper care of the birds. Livestock in general, not just poultry, are kind of uh, sort of a, an investment. They're kind of, um, you can almost see them as a, a walking bank account. African women are more likely to be responsible for poultry rather than large livestock, and this research may ultimately help protect a source of income important to them and their families. Increasing our investments in, in productivity of, of animals and of fish is a way to both address nutrition, but also recognizes that animals are often a major asset to a household. And if they can increase the numbers of, of, of particular small animals that they keep, that gives them some resilience to, to economic stress. Uh, the importance is of, of, of having animals that can produce and can survive diseases is as great, if not greater, for the smallholder families than uh, compared to our industry, because their livelihoods depend on it. Now, it's the same in, in, in North America, but it's life and death for, uh, for, for their children. 
For Market to Market, I'm Paul Yeager. You can watch this story on Newcastle Chicken Project at our Farm Week website, farmweek.msucares.com. You can also catch Farm Week stories on YouTube and Facebook, and we will have a link to the Market to Market website where you can see the story as well as read the script. And again, that's all at farmweek.msucares.com. And Leighton, of course, you know, getting the chicken's genome mapped, that can help those spot those characteristics that they can breed, put maybe two breeds together to get one that will be resistant to Newcastle. Right. Well, we are at the end of Farm Week for this week. On our next show, during the past 10 years, almost one million rural Americans have served in the military. You will be meeting a Nebraska veteran who found a life in agriculture after the service. Dan Rojas says a pastured poultry operation producing fresh eggs. Rojas says agriculture has helped him to heal the invisible wounds of war. For the rest of the Farm Rate crew, I'm Artis Ford. And I'm Leighton Spann. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.